Um, as a former academic, I'm going to try not to lecture you. I think everybody is grown enough not to be lectured, so I'll try to keep it as minimal as possible. But um, being here since yesterday, there were some great presentations, and there was a few tidbits that I want to reinforce, so here comes my academia coming back. How many of you remembered um, Judge Emmett's um, equation that he put up on his slide yesterday? Man, I would not like you in my class. You will fail. But given that his equation, basically, I'm going to butcher his equation a little bit, so I hope he doesn't find me being a judge. But his equation focused on resilience. And on the left-hand side of, the, of his equation, there were two components. One was related to mitigation. The other side of it was, um, here's where my butchering comes in, related to management. So with mitigation and management, you get resilience. Text Mesonet is going to deal with the mitigation side of it. So in butchering his equation, I've basically turned it out to that mitigation is proportional to management. Hopefully that works out. And when he talked about management, as in my terminology, he was referring to policy, priority, and resources. Those are the three terms that goes into management, and those are what makes any community resilient. So in putting all that together, I came up with something that I hope he isn't too ashamed of. The resiliency of a community depends upon its degree of management and mitigation to extreme events. And as the Houston flood czar um, said yesterday, we, are, we cannot prevent extreme events. The most we can do is mitigate their impacts. So text mesonet is all about mitigating those impacts. So my name, Kinte Green, you've heard Leon, multiple names. And Text Mesonet is basically a statewide initiative from the governor's office to install weather stations all across Texas. Okay, it works. We've had a lot of people messing up these um, slides. So the governor's office, after the memorial death floods, had a bunch of money and he decided to appropriate a bunch of it to the Texas Water Development Board with the intention of flood mitigation. As part of that, the Texas Water Development came up with a few ideas, and one of those ideas was text mezzanin. How can we mitigate floods? How can we mitigate the impact, the deaths, the loss of lives, the loss of property from these floods? <clears throat> So with text mesonet, we look at it as finishing the water cycle. We already do groundwater monitoring to um, well monitoring. We already do surface water monitoring. How about the water that is actually contributed by the atmosphere? And here's where text mesonet also comes in. So we kind of finish off that water cycle. The other component of text mesonet is to not to reinvent the wheel. There is a lot of networks within Texas already. You have LCRA, Low Colorado River Authority. You got Houston Control, um, Harris County Flood Control District, um, San Jacinto um, River Authority. There's a whole bunch of these networks already in existence. The problem is they don't always talk together. So one aspect of text mesonet is to bring all these networks together to create a clearinghouse for all that data. And not just to store that data, but to present that data in a single database, in a single mainframe, a single viewer. So why a mesonet? Why, who benefits from having this mesonet? I mean, if most of you in here have been around for a very long time, which I'm assuming everybody here is over 20 years old, 
You've probably heard of um, the Oklahoma mezzanine. It's basically the gold standard. It's about 121 stations that covers the whole of Oklahoma. But if you know who, who and what Texas is, Oklahoma is like a P compared to Texas. That's just me bravado. <laughs> so imagine trying to put that in the state of Texas. You have counties that are almost the size of Oklahoma. So 121 stations is just a drop in the bucket. So we have to do it way bigger. But like Texas, we have to do it cheaper and we have to do it smarter. So welcome to one of those challenges that is text mezzanine. So this is the benefits and who benefits from a text mezzanine. I am just going to focus on a few of those things. And it comes back to um, the previous speaker's comment about the triangles that goes into sustainability, the social, economic, and environmental aspects. So from a beneficiary, it's everybody. There's no one group or organization that benefits from a mezzanine. It's everybody in some form or fashion. But the ripple effects goes into irrigation, agriculture, saving lives, public awareness. There are still people who are somewhat ignorant to extreme weather events. I'm using a political word, but it's really climate change. But there is people who still say there's no such thing as extreme weather events. I think one previous presenter said it's the non-stationary weather events. I don't know how you explain that to a child, but it's non-stationary yeah, we'll move on from there. So, Tex Mesonet operates two types of stations, and they do different things, but they all have a primary goal of monitoring precipitation, monitoring soil conditions, meaning soil moisture and soil temperature conditions. Those are two of the primary things that, based on the goal or uh, the mandate of the money that was contributed to the Texas Water Development Board from the governor to mitigate floods we have to focus on. So on the left is a site that we recently installed about four weeks ago in Pecos County. Um, it's a primary site, 30-foot tower, has a full suite of um, equipment. One of those towers cost about $20,000 just to install and utilize the 30-foot tower, temperature, pressure, winds, has on enough equipment to do um, agricultural purposes, evapotranspiration. The bottom right is your secondary station, 10-foot tower, doesn't have pressure, doesn't have winds at 30 feet. The question I like to tell people is, when you listen to the meteorologist in the morning, he tells you that the winds are, let's say, from the south at 10 miles per hour. Do you consider that to be surface winds? And at what height do you think those surface winds are at? That's the question. Anybody here knows the answer? Huh? Mm, no. Uh, yeah. 10 meter tower, yeah, 30 feet. I always get my mathematics mixed up. But yes, it's at 30 feet. But most people, the average person will still think that surface winds is at six feet height. So <laughs> that's true, it's not that many people at 30 feet tall. But yes, that is the height at which surface winds is actually, it's the height at which um, the National Weather Service considers to be surface winds. So we are trying as much as possible to get as many of those stations out so we can get a proper grade so that we can improve the forecast from the National Weather Service, all in the concept of in mitigating floods. But it's not only floods, you got droughts and other things. So 
we have been around for what since 2016 so about two years now not a long time i said we're a very new program and this is where we are as i said texas is a very big state so we have a lot of ground cover to go and from this you can see our statewide coverage is only approximately 46 percent and that is just because we have not done the in a sense the texas panhandle we have left that to west texas mesonet all hail texas tech i'm sure there's aggies in here who's going to complain but yes <laughs> so with that as you can see there's a lot of places that we still need to go there's a lot of places that we need contacts there's a lot of places that are just void so if you know anybody in these places please tell them contact us everything that i'm presenting here it's free the weather stations are completely free um the maintenance cost is completely free the installation cost is completely free all you have to do is provide us the land and the land is only 40 feet by 40 feet that's it but some people don't want or uh, don't like the word free this is what we would like text mesonet to be this is an idealized network this will cover approximately over 300 stations just from text mesonet alone including the existing stations you're probably looking at about a network of about 500 or more with a grid of this scale there is no weather system that can come in or out of texas without us not knowing it on a localized level at this grid scale you can basically do any type of research relating to what i should say ground truth because everything now is moving into satellite base and satellite data even radar data need ground truth so the idea is that this type of a network will solve that problem but it's expensive and it's time consuming and it requires long sight long-term vision long-term planning which uh, requires management as i said mitigation is the inverse of management these are the existing networks that are within text mesonet currently as you can see except for probably harris county flood control district there's the others that are missing brazos san jacinto the whole bunch trinity they are missing um we're working on that is contacts they just need to get in contact with us we need to get in contact with them that's the problem the other side of text mesonet is we have all this data how do we get it to you how do we get it to the people who make the decisions the emergency managers the average user who's the environmental enthusiasts how do we get them to use that data and use it in a way that they can utilize it so we have this app viewer um this is an old slide this is old but here you can see from this slide what it can do this is all this is some of the data as you zoom in to this you can get more data so it's um, zoom um, the data depends upon what zoom level you are at so here we're just looking at one parameter and in this case you can in a sense visualize where the heat um is this yeah this temperature so you can in a, in a sense see where the heat wave actually is one is on the gulf coast one is further back west across the panhandle just some ideas these are some of the features we are constantly trying to improve right the moment you stop improving is the moment that you die so we're constantly trying to improve our website improve our functionality so on the left is what we currently add. as you can see is a lot of drop down buttons a lot of push buttons check tabs we're actually trying to simplify it put everything right at the user's um first click <clears throat> 
These are some of the products that we're um, currently producing. We're going to expand these. So here you're looking at um, 24 hours, 7 day, and 30 day precipitation. Readily available. You can actually click on these, save it. The data is actually there, so you can actually download the data. It's all available. This is temperature, 24 hour min and max, and this is on a state level. So I know there's a lot of uh, people who would love to get this type of data. So to achieve all of that requires a lot of background work. Everything requires resources. Resources in this case is money. It's all about money. Here we're looking at about text messaging that uses about four servers to accomplish this task. Four servers that are split up into different aspects, all that are critical. The good thing about it is welcome to the cloud. Scalability, redundancy, it's all built in. So you don't have to worry about that anymore. ITs love that aspect. These servers, one controls the brain, which is our utility server. You have a database server, which basically all the raw data that comes in from all of our stations and the existing stations. Application servers, right now everything is based on app GIS. So we do utilize that. We are currently um, shifting over, I should say, we have shift over to an open source version, which is Leaflet. So some of you might be familiar with that. And then we have a storage server for long-term archiving. Data that has been quality controlled, post-processed, and put for researchers to utilize. And if they ever do need the raw data, it is there. It never gets touched. The other side of it is not just the servers. You also have to deal with communication. How do you get all these stations to transmit their data to a central repository? Right now, we are using cellular modem. And here's where you might have a little problem between which one is better. There is Verizon, there is AT&T. Some of you know, if you're in an urban area, Verizon is probably the best. When you get out west, Pecos County, Verizon basically is a dead state. You have to go to AT&T. So pick your poison. Some people might say it's better with Sprint. It might be better with T-Mobile. Right now, the two choices is Verizon or AT&T. We stuck with AT&T. Welcome to a state DIR. So that's where we are. To do that, imagine having 300 stations, each on a communication plan, and your cell phone bill is $20 a month. It can add up. <laughs> Here's where it comes back to resources. Unfortunately, there's cheaper ways, and we're constantly working on that. Cheaper ways, radio communication, you don't have that monthly fee. But that's what we have to deal with from the other aspect, communication. The other side of it is you have the servers that stores the data, collects the data. You have a means of getting the data to your repository, which are your servers. The other side now is how do you manage all that data? There has to be a quick and easy way of doing that. Right now, our process is going to be one way. It's an off-the-shelf commercial application. Um, Harris County Flood Control District actually use, utilizes it, and there's a few others within the state of Texas that utilizes it. Very helpful. It can do the job that a lot of people would have normally been, would have had to do. So it cuts back in cost. It all comes back to money. However, it can only do so much, right? And with a network as big as Texas, it can only do so much. And we are limited in manpower. Right now, I can tell you, text mezzanine is three people for the state of Texas. Oklahoma runs off of um, 15 people. Um, 
doesn't, yeah, that doesn't work too well. But that's what we have to do. Along with that is data processing. You have all this data coming in. You have a place to store it. How do you put it in a format that the people who need it can utilize it? This is where the data programmers come in. In this case, this is where I come in. This is just a simplified version of the scripts that have to be written and what the automation allows to happen. This data comes in every 15 minutes. We come January 1st is hoping to make that every five minutes. So imagine if somebody had to do this manually, not practical. So everything needs to be automated. And in automation, somebody has to write the script, make sure that it works, make sure that it's done on a timely schedule. And this is what is currently running right now in text mesonet. And as we get more data, as we get more applications, as users give us more information, these scripts are going to expand to provide the data and the products that end users require. So we are constantly asking the public, tell us what you need. Tell us what information you need and in what format you, you require it so that we can generate the product for you in a quick and easy format because we do have the data to give you what you need. So what are the challenges and lessons? I've mentioned a few of it, but I'm going to go over a few of them. I love this image. This is one of the biggest challenges that is in Texas. And from a meteorologist, this is a big X. This is, no. Right? This is a weighing gauge on probably what? A 12 foot, 15 foot pole? The question being, is that truly representative of the amount of rainfall that is collected in that area? The answer is no. Rainfall should be measured as close as possible to the ground, just to avoid evaporation. And as you know, wind speed increases with height. So that is a no-no. The other things associated with that is trees, roads, buildings, all those things act to actually reduce the amount of rainfall is generated in that bucket. But we do understand that there's the issues of easement and all those other issues. And in a city like Harris County, or I should say in a city like Houston, it's almost impossible to find open space. So something like that is probably the only resource you have. But from a meteorological standpoint, from quality data, this is a no. From an administrative level, Tex Mesonet has to deal with seven National Weather Service offices, three river forecast centers, 18 river authority, 16 groundwater management areas, 100 ground conservation water conservation districts, 254 counties three people. Uh, that's a big, yeah, that's a big challenge right there. Coordinating that many people, that many agencies, that many counties by three people. This is what it looks like geographically dealing with all of that. As I said, Texas is big, Oklahoma is small. Oklahoma has about two climate regions, Texas 10, each distinct in its own way. Not only do you have that climatic pattern, you also have a, um, a big distinction when it comes to soil type. As I said, every station measures soil temperature and soil moisture. Texas has 62 different soil types, 15 of which are major. I like to say that is one very talented Charles Picasso, and that's just Mother Nature. So imagine trying to simplify that in our network. As most of you in here already know, precipitation across Texas varies from east to west. What you might not know is that it's very linear. 
It's basically a straight line. How was Mother Nature able to do that? I can't tell you, but that's just the way it is. Very linear lines from east to west. And that is what we have to um, try to simplify in our network, balancing that. But unless you have the right type of network, you cannot truly pick up that type of delineation. And there might be more variations in that network on a localized scale. The problem is we don't know because we don't have the data. Or we don't have the quality data to figure out whether there's variations in that delinearity. But one of the things that we do know is that Texas continues to grow. Major cities continue to expand. And some areas tend to get smaller. From a technical standpoint, as I said, text mesonet is con continuously evolving. When we started out, everything used to look like a hodgepodge, wires all over the place. This is what it looks like now, much cleaner, much easier to work with, less chance of making mistakes. Um, we've made improvements in terms of installation. An installation used to take us anywhere from a week to two to three weeks. Now we can do an installation in two days, right? On average, we go about three, but we can do it in two days. Um, so with that, try to simplify it. We have to deal with the political nature that is Texas. We have to deal with the fact that it's a two-year budget cycle, and you don't know what the money is going to be after that. So you have to be able to sustain yourself within budget, between legislative sessions. In order to get something this big, going fast, and be able to complete it, you need buying from a local level. It has to be from the local level. You cannot run it from a top down, because there's no way you're gonna get the landowners to trust you to put equipment on their property. So you have to start from the local level. You also have to get the support from the authorities. The National Weather Service, the River Forecast Authorities, those guys, they have to want the data that you're going to collect, and they have to believe in what you're doing. The other side of it is standardization. You have to simplify your process. It's almost like the Ford model, specialization. You have to be able to do that to get it done cheaply, but get it done properly. And what I always like to tell um, the team and where I work is we have to think outside of the box. Tried and true isn't always the best. It works, yes, but it's not the best. And in order to get something like text mesonet done, done in a timely fashion and done cheaply, you have to think outside of the box. So with that, I'm finished. This is just some of the pictures. Um, that is actually uh, um, Director Jackson, if you're familiar with um, the board from Texas Water Development Board. Um, this is actually in um, Guadalupe County, GCD. This is our contact information if you need to, and I would like to show you this is what we were doing during Harvey. So you can actually see um, some of the numbers that were coming up on our website. Any questions? Yes. The, air, the, the airports are actually the National Weather Service FAA sites. So we do consider them as primary networks. Okay. Yes. All you need to do is either send me an email or I can actually give you an application today. And you sign it and that's it. It's as simple as that. And as simple as I say, the contract is basically give me 60 days and I'm gone. No if, buts, or and about it. 60 days notice. That's it. No money involved. You just need to sign it. Any other questions? Yes. 
Yes, back there, ma'am. Um, we have, um, Oklahoma Mesonet have been charging for data prior to that. Um, it was just minimal fee for data access. Because this is a state funded, we cannot see us charging for data that the public is already paying us for. However, it is a possibility depending upon the, the data request. So just like Tinnewis, if you're asking for something that is 30 years of data, we might charge you just for the CD or just for the time just to do the data, but we cannot charge you for something that you're already paying for. Any other questions? Yes. I, can't, I didn't hear you, sorry. Do you have enough locations in Harris County or do you need more stations? Um, as I said, this is, this is one of the old slides. I guess it didn't get updated, but I'm actually looking for three locations in Harris County. I'm actually looking for one that is northwest along that, um, I think it's U.S. Highway or Interstate that runs up to the northwest, northwest end of Harris County. I'm looking for one that is central, um, just north of Houston. Uh, I'm not familiar with the Houston area. And the other one would be south of, what is that? I think it's probably the San Jacinto um, River, but close to the border. So that central area in um, Harris County, central east Harris County. I'm actually looking for three areas out there. But I'm actually working with the um, HCFCD in actually trying to find some sites, but as you know, it's really hard to find locations in, yeah, Harris County. Any other questions? I think you had a, yes. Hang on, get the microphone. <laughs> so uh, how are you maintaining these stations? Are you doing any remote maintenance on them? Maintenance, if something breaks, we drive out and fix it. Oh, so okay. I'm very familiar with almost all the counties in Texas, <laughs> right? I've driven to Russ County in the east. I've driven to, what's that, um, Pecos County in the west. I have to go to El Paso, which I'm dreading. Two weeks ago, I just came from Star County. So as you can see, I'm getting familiar with the highways and byways of Texas. It's not good on the Tushy driving for six hours. And it hurts. But we're still looking for people, especially on the Gulf Coast. Nobody wants to. I have no clue what's going on. They're, it's free. It's $20,000. Who doesn't like money? I guess Texas prefer to give it away. Yes. No, it's all remote. Solar power, as I said, all we need is the space. That's the only thing we need. 40 feet by 40 feet. I mean, people here have, I've been on a ranch that was what, 20,000 acres? And people tell me they don't have enough space. <laughs> I don't get it, right? My property is only 2,200 square feet, but any other questions? <laughs> no, no questions? Right. It's Thank been you. a pleasure. Oh, I think somebody back. Oh, he's stretching. He's stretching. <laughs> he's getting great. Oh, no problem. Thank no, you. No problem.